Greetings, and welcome to the Friday Night Lecture Series at St. John's College Annapolis. I'm very pleased to introduce our lecturer this evening, Mr. Jared Loggins. Currently visiting at Amherst College, this year Mr. Loggins will be assuming a position at Amherst as an Assistant Professor of Black Studies and of Political Science. Professor Loggins is presently finishing, uh, has submitted a dissertation on W.E.B. Du Bois entitled, Du Bois' Litany, The Political Theory of Dark Water. He's earning his doctorate at Brown University after having studied at UCLA and having earned his bachelor's at Morehouse College. Mr. Loggins' research explores the relationship between capitalism and democracy in modern and contemporary politics as understood through the lens of Black intellectuals and activists in 19th and 20th century Atlantic world. In addition to his work on Du Bois, Professor Loggins has a forthcoming book co-authored with Andrew Douglas that explores Martin Luther King Jr.'s critique of racial capitalism. The book is entitled, Prophet of Discontent. While it's unfortunate that we are unable to bring Professor Loggins to our campus today, I'm consoled by the fact that he has visited St. John's before in the summer of 2019. He was one of several faculty participants in a week-long series of seminars on African-American political thought. The seminars, sponsored and organized by the American Enterprise Institute and by the United Negro College Fund, included scholarship students and esteemed faculty from around the country, joined by a few St. John students and tutors. It's a pleasure to have Professor Loggins return to St. John's tonight and to introduce him to a broader part of our community and to our many guests. Before we proceed, I wanna remind everyone that the lecture is followed by a question period and the question period will proceed on a separate Zoom link. So if you don't have the Zoom link for the question period, you can find it on the webpage for the formal lecture series at St. John's College Annapolis. The lecture tonight is entitled W.E.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk and the Democratic Catastrophe of the Color Line. Professor Loggins, welcome. Welcome to St. John's. Uh, thank you, Joseph, for the, for the introduction. And let me give a special shout out to Zena Hitz out in the audience, uh, who is a wonderful colleague uh, and comrade. She's a tutor at St. John's. Um, so as Joseph said, this is my, uh, this is my really second time here at St. John's. I was here several uh, summers ago. I co-taught a seminar uh, with several colleagues um, on the theme of freedom in, in the history of African-American political thought. And, and so we began with David Walker, Frederick Douglass in the 19th century. We embarked on a journey um, that was guided by the question of what freedom has entailed um, in the struggle against racial subjugation and its various permutations, including uh, chattel slavery, wage slavery, lynching, patriarchy, disenfranchisement, and so forth. We ended the course with uh, Audre Lorde, whose exceptionally wide-ranging work is useful in reminding us that no struggle is a single issue struggle, um, and that in paying attention to the, to the particularity of a community suffering, where we can find our traveling partners in the struggle um, against domination. Lorde arrived here by embracing the idea of an historically accumulating consciousness. Who knew better about what freedom entailed than those who had already confronted and resisted the unbearableness of slavery, of dispossession, of Jim Crow, uh, and of the stultifying conditions of capitalism. Lord reminded us that the, the very best of the African-American political philosophical tradition understood the importance of historical consciousness and that our task as contemporary interpreters uh, is to search the figures and movements that form the tradition reading their lives like signposts on the road, as she tells us, what we can learn from, from them, we can clearly learn from their mistakes, but while refusing to lessen our debts to them, and as she put it, we can learn, um, we can read them not in order to recreate the world, but to become ourselves by thinking for ourselves. This is a powerful claim because what it suggests to us is that reading history, and in particular reading the history of subjection and resistance, must never be mistaken as action itself. The past indeed guides us and in some ways it casts a shadow over our present. And yet whatever we do, 
whatever we deem possible in the world, it is possible because we do it. It is possible because we act in the present. And because we act, um, we have to make choices about how we wish to deploy the history that we read. How and to what extent is the past usable um, in the present? To think historically is to be uncertain about our judgments. It is to raise questions about what it is, about what is and what is not called for, about what is and is not timely or untimely. How ought we, for example, respond to a situation not only where the past seems to bear so heavily on the present, but where the present involves a certain novelty for which the past is of little use to us. We see the intensifying cruelty, for example, of police and, and uh, policing and the carceral state unfolding across the country. And yet so many of us, people of color included, call for the diversification of police forces rather than abolition. How do we deal with the strangeness of this situation, right? A young 13 year old kid was just killed by police in Chicago, a police force which is one of the most racially and ethnically diverse in the country. We can and must turn to the past in order to make sense of the situation. But do we not also need to depart from it in order to confront the novelty of what we face? Aside from this question about the past, I also think we can ask in light of Du Bois whether the political philosophical vision we have in view um, matches the gravity of the circumstances that we confront. Du Bois is always changing his mind, right? Um, and this has something to do with the agility of the matter or matters or problems that a particular moment demands. The Du Bois of Souls is not quite the same as the Du Bois of Darkwater of 1920 or the Du Bois of, of Black Reconstruction of 1935. May I use the example of African-Americans to sort of think about these kind of problems of domination, but we can also do this with respect to the classics. And because we're here um, at St. John's, I think, there are other examples that we can draw on. So for example, um, I recently um, read again, uh, Antigone. Antigone and her conflict with Creon, she raises something of a perennial problem of tyranny and domination. And so we might ask, what is its ongoing relevance to contemporary problems? There's a, there's a kind of perennial nature of the problem of tyranny and domination that Antigone raises. Of course, our world is not Antigone's world, right? But that is not the point. Of raising the question. The point is that this seminal historical text bears the trace of a perennial problem from which we might read in order to draw lessons. Those who are interested um, should seek it out, but several years ago the Theater of War project uh, performed a dramatic reading of, of Antigone following the killing of Michael Brown uh, in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. Uh, it was titled Antigone and Ferguson and what it what it was really was an effort on the part of residents um, to raise deeper philosophical questions about the kind of society that at once extinguishes black life and refuses them even the dignity of death. And that's the kind of problem that Antigone, Antigone raises. I wanna use Lord's provocation uh, as an opening to explore that classic political philosophical text, The Souls of Black Folk, written in 1903 by arguably the most consequential black intellectual of the 20th century, W.E.B. Du Bois. To say that it is a political philosophical text is not to deny the fact that Du Bois is among other things, a sociologist and a historian and a poet. He's all of these things bundled, bundled together. But what The Souls of Black Folk is powerfully I think, is a political philosophical text. He gives us a political philosophical vision, vision concerning African-Americans and concerning the American polity. Among the many things that Souls gives us, it gives us an account of the present past. The idea that so long as a people experience dispossession and immiseration and hunger and violence, insult, partition, those people are not living in the presence of freedom, but rather those people are living in the afterlife of slavery. 
And to say that they live in the afterlife of slavery is not to surrender the capacity of judgment to the past, rather. It is to make the evaluation that the world they inhabit is one where unfreedom continues to reign. Du Bois reflecting on his past is a moment for us to reflect on ours, for he inhabited the oppressive world of the afterlife of slavery. And here I'm quoting him. The nation has not yet found peace from its sins. The freedom has not yet found, the freedman has not yet found in freedom his promised land. Whatever good may have come in these years of change, the shadow of a deep disappointment rests on the Negro people. A disappointment all the more bitter because the unattained ideal was unbounded, saved by the simple ignorance of a lonely people. The freedman has not yet found his freedom. It's a strange formulation. This is obviously an historical claim about the end of Reconstruction and the dark period that followed. What he is suggesting though, is that freedom does not merely persist in the absence of constraints. It requires a whole web of persons and institutions for its substantive expression. And without the web of institutions and persons, there is nothing but the shadow of disappointment. Nominal freedom, Du Bois wants to say, is not freedom at all. This is one reason why I think we should read Souls, aside from the gorgeousness of his prose. Souls elaborates a world that, that sits in between the moment of emancipation and the withholding of freedom. Du Bois grapples with the inadequacy of political vision, and yet he sees possibility in the continued struggle against oppression. To be sure, the story that Du Bois tells here in Souls places the lives of African Americans front and center, and certainly in his later work, particularly the 1920 book, Dark Water Voices from Within the Veil, he exposes the moral co corruption at the heart of what he calls personal whiteness. Even so, what he offers here is nothing less than shame directed at his white counterparts for rendering a world in which black people are vulnerable, vulnerable to domination. Souls established Du Bois as a leader of African-Americans and later in a, as, a, as a leader in the global anti-colonial struggle, its influence can be, can be gleaned among many places in the reception it received at the announcement of his death at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. Upon learning of his death, Roy Wilkins, who's one of the key organizers of the March on Washington, he takes to the podium to instruct the crowd of more than a, than a quarter million that if you want to read something that applies to 1963, go back and get a volume of The Souls of Black Folk by Du Bois published in 1903. that souls cast a shadow over the, one of the most consequential mass demonstrations in US history has something to do with the persistence of that formulation. And Du Bois issues in three different places in the text. And that formulation is the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the colored line. That formulation immediately raises a puzzle. He wrote the words at the dawn of the 20th century in 1903 predating the imperialist World War I, the wave of anti-colonial independence movements that began to emerge soon thereafter, the long civil rights struggle. I wanna suggest that we read this formulation, therefore, both as an observation of his present, as well as a prophecy or a warning. To say it as a prophecy is to say that it raises alarm about what is to follow by failing to undermine the color line. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, and it will continue to be the problem of the color line so long as Americans fail to act. Du Bois was certainly well positioned to make such an observation. He attended Fisk University from 1885 to 1888. Here he had traveled south from Great Barrington, Massachusetts for the first time. It is here that he sees, as he describes it, and I'm quoting him, the world split between black and white and where the darker half was held back by race prejudice, legal bonds, 
ignorance, and dire poverty. Yet, Du Bois had come to Fisk armed with the new sense of himself. As he, later, as he later recounts in a biographical essay, ah, the wonder of the journey with this faint spice of adventure as I entered the land of slaves. The never to be forgotten marvel of that first supper at Fisk with the world colored and opposite two of the most beautiful beings God ever revealed to the eyes of 17. I promptly lost my appetite, but I was deliriously happy. This is Du Bois with the sort of turn of the century, Jones and his bones. After graduating from Fisk in 1888, Du Bois attends Harvard College for two years. He earns his second bachelor's degree in history. He was advised by William James and the historian and the historian Albert Bushnell Hart. He enters the sociology graduate program at Harvard in 1891. A year into the program, he receives a scholarship to study in Berlin. In Berlin, aside from studying under German social scientists like Gustav von Schmoller and Adolf Wagner, he comes face, to, comes face to face for the first time with the possibility of his manhood untethered from color prejudice. I'm quoting him. I found myself on the inside of the American world. I found myself on the outside of the American world looking in with me were white folk, students, acquaintances, teachers who viewed the scene with me. They did not always pause to regard me as a curiosity or something subhuman. I was just a man of the somewhat privileged student rank with whom they were glad to meet and talk over the world, particularly, particularly the part of the world whence I came. After two years in Berlin, Du Bois drops back into what what he calls nigger hating America. He receives his PhD from Harvard in 1895. And by this point, he has developed a set of methods through which to understand this maddening world historical problem of the color line. He senses at this point in his intellectual life that the color line could be reasoned away. The proper orga organization of knowledge would lead to enlightenment and therefore to the ultimate destruction, demise of the color line. In 1899, he publishes what is going to turn out to be a landmark study of sociology, the Philadelphia Negro. The Philadelphia Negro is in many ways an attempt to use the organization and dispensation of knowledge, facts, to transform the problem to which he indebts, he, he, to which he indebted his intellectual and political life. For at this point, the problem of the color line was essentially a problem, or partly a problem of the perception of black people. And if the image of black people in the eyes of their white counterparts could reflect their equal capability rather than backwardness or ignorance or shiftlessness, the color line might fall away. Something happens in 1899 that to essentially throw this view into, into crisis. Um, and that is the lynching of Sam Hose. Sam Hose was an itinerant worker on a farm outside of Atlanta in a place called Noonan, Georgia. Uh, according to reports, he gets into some kind of dispute with his landlord after which he allegedly uh, kills the landlord in self-defense. A 10 day manhunt ensues the Atlanta Constitution, other local newspapers, essentially tack on uh, fanciful charges that Hoes had also raped the landlord's wife and committed other acts. Hoes is eventually caught um, and he's brutally lynched in a carnivalist, carnivalist act of violence in which thousands are alleged to have participated as spectators. In 1889, Du Bois is a professor uh, at Atlanta University. And so he has, um, he, had, he had a kind of special standing in the Atlanta social and political community, enough to hand deliver a letter of censure to the editors of the Atlanta Constitution for its role in the lynching. Du Bois never makes it to the office. On his way, he allegedly received word that parts of Hose's body were on display in a local storefront along his walking path. He turns around, he walks in the other direction and he has changed forever. He calls the episode a scar on his soul. 
as he recounts in Souls, Sam Hose's lynching was a crucifixion. It was the expression of a kind of covenant between whites to secure their flourishing on the backs and with the blood of their black counterparts. If Du Bois had previously been under any illusion that facts properly organized could alone affect the color line, that illusion was broken by the Sam Hose lynching because the lynching was pure cruelty and pure cruelty cannot be reasoned away, cannot be reasoned away. It is here in Souls where Du Bois vows to write of the genius, the humanity, the enviable destiny of his race with such passion, eloquence, and penetration that the claims of African-American inferiority would be sent reeling. More than his encounter in the Great Barrington Schoolhouse with the hint that he was unlike the other children, more than the prejudice he experienced at Harvard, more than the conditions he investigates in turn of the century black Philadelphia, the Sam Hose lynching and the surrounding spectacle helped Du Bois to clearly see that the practice of white supremacy was the cunning of reason and the cunning of reason cannot be unsettled on facts alone, it must be fought. The Hose lynching is the moment Du Bois senses that something was necessary beyond, beyond reason to unsettle the color line. Black people had to create, I wanna suggest, the entire dramaturgy of a world that called into existence that very capacity that is the basis for all genuinely free communities and that is the capacity to speak on equal standing with one's fellows. There are many historical analogies to sort of draw to help us make sense of what Du Bois is after, but since I'm lecturing, lecturing here to students, um, at St. John's, and because Du Bois himself was a professor of classics, I turn to the case of the plebeian secession in Aventine Hill in 494 BCE. The plebeians, the plebeians are not regarded by their patrician counterparts as speaking subjects. In the eyes of the patricians, plebeians live a purely individual life that passes on nothing to posterity except for life itself. And so they stage a conflict in which what is at stake is the figuring out of whether or not a common language can be forged at all. They do the unthinkable. They establish another order, another partition. They constitute themselves not as warriors equal to other warriors, but as speaking beings sharing the same properties of those who would deny them these. I want to suggest that something similar is at stake in souls. Du Bois' overarching concern is with thinking with African-Americans in order to see that drama unfolding among former slaves aimed at making perceptible what had been understood as imperceptible that African-Americans can build a common world by virtue of their capacity to speak. This is the source of their political power. We see this everywhere in souls, but perhaps most notably in the final chapter of the book, the Sorrow Songs, in which he describes the spiritual as an attempt to bring the nation into a different relationship to itself. I'm quoting him, actively we have woven ourselves with the very warp and woof of this nation. We fought their battles, shared their sorrow, mingled our blood with theirs and generation after generation have pleaded with a headstrong careless people to despise not justice, mercy and truth, lest the nation be smitten with the curse. And here's the line, our song, our tool, our cheer and warning have been given to this nation in blood brotherhood. Are not these gifts worth the giving? Is not this work and striving? Would America have been America without her Negro people? Souls may well be understood as a, as a testing out of whether a common language can be forged, one in which it is possible, as Du Bois says, for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon his fellows, uh, spit upon by his fellows, without having the doors of opportunity closed roughly in his face. 
This formulation, of course, raises the question of how those living under condition of, non of domination should actually fight it. Should they immigrate? This was a proposal put forth by Martin Delaney of 1852. Marcus Garvey in the 1920s, Delaney wanted to say that the physical law is legitimately aligned against African-Americans and in a way that cannot be resolved via the law itself. Should Black people accommodate or acquiesce? This is the proposal put forth by Booker T. Washington, most notably in 1895. I'll have more to say about Washington's position in a moment, but Du Bois, Suffice it to say that Du Bois vehemently disagrees with both of these positions, in part because he believes that the promised land, he uses his language, the promised land for African-Americans, only a few decades removed from emancipation and reconstruction, remains the land of their fathers and mothers. The point, to put it rather crudely, is that because we are here, because we are likely going nowhere, we might as well fight. rhetoric, the deployment of Black voice, and the building of a drama around Black voices, this is the means through which, in souls, he thinks that African Americans must fight white supremacy. Recall for a moment the example of the plebeians at Aventine Hill. Before they finally depart from the idea of a common political life, they must verify that they can share a world with their counterparts and they must verify that conflict with the patricians and they must verify that it is not an incommensurate conflict. And they do so through a series of speech acts, which is the ultimate expression of their moral and ethical authority. Recall what Du Bois says about the Black Belt. It was not as many had, had assumed a movement toward fields of labor under more climatic labor conditions. It was, and I'm quoting him, primarily a huddling for self-protection, a massing of the black population for mutual defense in order to secure the peace and tranquility necessary to economic advance. This huddling for self-defense is a kind of striking out against the Southern racist economic machine. In the practice of withdrawal, those former slaves, dead peons, of the Black Belt want to say that they will be respected or they will make their discontent known. Of course, there is a version of this argument also in the, in the wings of Atlanta. Atlanta is that shining city on the hill from below. It is the place where men strive to exemplify righteous ideals out from underneath the shadow of slavery. It is the place of collective striving. Du Bois begins that chapter with a hymn by the abolitionist, John Greenleaf Whittier. Oh, black boy of Atlanta, but half was spoken. The slaves chains and the masters alike are broken. The one curse of the races held both in tether. They are rising, all are rising. The black are rising together and yet, and yet, the problem of Atlanta is the problem of wealth. Atlanta, as Du Bois wants to say, is a grand aspiration indeed. Work and wealth are mighty levers to lift this old new land. Thrift and toil and saving are the highways to new hopes and new possibilities. And yet the warning is, is needed, lest the wily Hippopanes tempt Atlanta to thinking that golden apples are the goal of racing and not mere incidents by the way. Du Bois here, drawing on his classical training, is suggesting that wealth accumulation is antithetical to the notion of a free city. As the mythology goes, in one race, Hippopanes was given three golden apples. When he dropped, when he dropped them, Atalanta, the goddess of foot racing, stopped to pick them up and therefore lost the race. It is not enough. Du Bois wants to say, to merely retreat, to build the partition of equal standing, that retreat must be informed by a set of first principles. And among them is a rejection of the idea that material prosperity is the basis of all that is right and good. Again, catastrophe looms here, and I'm quoting him. How dare a danger, how, how dire a danger uh, lies before a new land and a new city, lest Atlanta 
stooping from your gold, shall find that gold cursed. I want to suggest that the deployment of rhetoric has a specific political philosophical aim. It is underdeveloped to be sure, but it is there. And that aim is abolition democracy. That term abolition democracy appears forcefully in the 1935 book, Black Reconstruction, where he recounts the central role of African-Americans in the construction of democracy after the Civil War. Souls is written against the shadow of reconstruction, that grand movement to make a democracy of equal persons for the first time, as Du Bois puts it here in Souls, it is a government of men. In that chapter of the dawn of freedom, Du Bois writes of that grand aspiration, the Freedmen's Bureau, an aspiration that white Southerners ultimately squander. In effect, this tale of the dawn of freedom, I'm quoting him, is an account of that government of, uh, government of men called the Freedmen's Bureau, one of the singular and interesting of the attempts made by a great nation to grapple with its vast problems of race and social condition. Reconstruction is defeated under the weight of bitter attack, yet the failure of this abolition democracy in the form of reconstruction casts a shadow into the future. It is, as the boys will later put it, a splendid failure. The boys wants to say that reconstruction exemplifies a future that is still worth striving for. What Du Bois was saying by having faith, even amid the failure of reconstruction, was that it was the only way to respond to the catastrophe of the color line. Here are his words. The passing of a human institution before its work is done, like the untimely passing of a single soul, but leaves a legacy of striving for other men. The legacy of the Freedmen's Bureau is the heavy heritage of this generation. Today, when new and vaster problems are destined to strain every fiber of the national mind and soul, would it not be well to count this legacy honestly and carefully? For this much all men know, despite compromise, war, and struggle, the Negro is not free in the backward, in the backwoods of the Gulf states. For miles and miles, he may not leave the plantation of his birth. Taxation without representation is the rule of their political life. The Negro is not free. And therefore, the project of Reconstruction remains an aspiration for Du Bois. The struggle for abolition democracy is already there in souls. It's motivated by a lingering disappointment a disappointment marked by a failure to ultimately become new subjects, a failure to reconstitute society in the name of freedom. Recall the two figures that illuminate the disappointment of Reconstruction's failure. This is in Of the Dawn of Freedom, the white gray-haired son of former masters and the black mother of former slaves, the gray-haired gentleman bows to the evil of slavery because abolition is so unfathomable to him. And so in his late years, he is blighted, ruined. He has hate in his eyes. He cannot imagine a world in which he shares a common life with his black counterparts. The black mother, whose face is awful with the mist of centuries, as the boy says, she bends at the cradle of her former master's sons even as her own children's limbs are torn apart by white mobs. These are, to be sure, two vastly different kinds of disappointment. In the former, the disappointment is really a misapprehension of loss. The gray-haired gentleman has imagined that he has genuinely lost something of himself with the end of slavery. He imagines this because something about his freedom has come to mean the subjection of others. But the disappointment of the black mother, this is a profound loss. This is a profound disappointment. 
not only because she experiences a debasement by caring for her former master's children, the very master who once summoned her under the force of the whip, she also experiences the disappointment and profound sadness and profound despair of losing her child to the gratuitous violence of the lynch mob. The gray-haired gentleman lacks vitality, but the black mother has lost her motivation, her sense of direction. She has lost her motivation because the very thing that gave expression to her longing, her striving, was taken away from her. If children are one way in which we cast our present longing into a future that will outlive us, that longing is effectively dead at the moment of, of the child's death. And then the question, how shall we love again? I can't get over this passage. The first thing as I was reading this over the last few days was reminded of the mother of Dante Wright, the mother of George Floyd. They have to confront their, their question. How do they love again? What is their longing? What is their striving? after they have lost the very thing that's, that gave them a sense of themselves, that gave them a sense of direction. And of course, there's Du Bois's anguish at the death of his own child, which he recounts in of the passing of the firstborn. It is, I think, one of the darker passages in the book because here we see Du Bois confronting the thin line between the, thre the, the threshold of a world that has ended for him with the death of his son and the possibility of moving on from that world toward a different one. Du Bois has to learn how to love again. Here are his words on the moment of his son's death. I shirk not, I long for work, I pant for a life full of striving. I am no coward to shrink before the rugged rush of the storm, nor even quailed before the awful shadow of the veil. But hearken, O death, is this not, is not my life hard enough? Is not that dull land that stretches its staring web across me cold enough? Is not all the world beyond these four little walls pitiless enough? But that thou must needs enter here, thou, O death? Du Bois, in his profound anguish, he musters the strength to move on in the face of profound grief and tragedy. The boys are not so fortunate, nor is the childless Black mother. One thing that is striking about of the, the passing of the firstborn, there's a silence. What about Nina Du Bois? What about her sense of futurity? What about her world? that has ended at the death of her child. What of her longing was lost? On these questions, the boys cannot answer. He does, however, sound a familiar theme in African-American political thought when he wonders whether death saved his child from a life of misery within the veil. I'm quoting him, better far this nameless void that stops my life than a sea of sorrow for you. The passage should bring to mind Toni Morrison's beloved, for example. Remember that story in the beginning of Souls in which Du Bois recounts the peculiar experience of coming face to face with the color line? He says something several lines into that story that actually connects with the, with the resignation expressed in the figure of the childless Black mother. Du Bois first acknowledges a will to refuse the color bar. The question was not whether he could refuse it in his mind. It was how he would do so. And thus we get the line, Du Bois says, shall I read the law? Shall I heal the sick? Shall I tell wonderful stories? Some way, Du Bois wants to say, he is going to defeat the color line. He is going to strive beyond the color line, but then he says the following. With other black boys, 
and I'm quoting him. The strife was not so fiercely sunny. Their youth shrank into tasteless sycophancy or into silent hatred of the pale world about them and mocking distrust of everything white or wasted itself in a bitter cry. Why did God make me an outcast and a stranger in mine own house? The shades of the prison house closed, closed, closed around about us all, walls straight and stubborn to the whitest, but relentlessly narrow, tall and unscalable to sons of night who must plod darkly on in resignation or beat unavailing palms against the stone or steadily, half hopelessly, watch the streak of blue above. This is the danger of white supremacy. It can lead to a kind of resignation. It can lead to a kind of existential doubt. It can lead one to ask, why try at all? Du Bois is, of course, bringing himself into mutual relation with the other Black boys. The shades of the prison house close around us all. But the story also suggests to us, I think, particularly the juxtaposition between the world that Du Bois is able to build for himself and the world of the Black boys is that a society grounded in pure luck is not a substantively democratic society. There's an insidious form of arbitrariness here that Du Bois is picking up on. To be at the mercy of another under conditions of white supremacy is to be unfree. Yes, something about what we accomplish in the world bears the trace of others. And this is the reality of living in a community. And yet, and yet, what we all should hope for, certainly what Du Bois aspires to, is the building of a community in which we stand shoulder to shoulder with others, not groveling as sycophants, but occupying the world of equal standing and interdependence. Du Bois, of course, recognizes the problem of luck quite clearly much later um, when he writes of his early life in remarkably atomistic terms. I'm quoting him. He was bursting with the joy of living. He seemed to ride in conquering might. He was the captain of his soul and master of his fate. He willed to do and it was done. He wished and the wish came true. And then the reality of the color line comes crashing down around him. Much like the experience of being closed in the prison house. And he says, for the first time in my life, I realized that there were limits to my will to do. The day of miracles was past and a long gray road of dogged work lie ahead. It was the work of social equality. The work of building a world unbound by the color line, untethered to the notion that luck is the source of flourishing. It's impossible, I think, to overstate the extent to which the politics of Booker T. Washington is the motivation for the book as a whole. He is there as a kind of specter, haunting the arguments of the book from beginning to end. Du Bois opens the book by telling us that the struggle toward emancipation was not simply about the securing of political power, though this certainly was the case. The struggle for freedom was also about cultivating, as Du Bois says, a longing to know. And as Du Bois would have it, who more than anyone had been suspicious of the idea of grounding self-assertion in a longing for knowledge and philosophical self-reflection, as Du Bois says, it was Booker T. Washington. Washington was born enslaved in 1856. After emancipation, his family moves to West Virginia in 1872. Washington works his way through Hampton Institute. He becomes in 1881, the first leader of the Tuskegee Institute where he essentially begins to build a massive financial and political machine organized around the idea that black people, particularly in the South, particularly poor black people should give up on social equality in the hopes 
of becoming powerful as industrial workers and building wealth. This was Washington wanted to say the only path toward equality. In 1895, this doctrine comes fully into view in a speech that effectively makes him a leading voice of African-Americans in the South. The speech is attended by thousands, including itinerant workers, ministers, and even white philanthropists and politicians in the North, but especially in the South. Here's a passage from that speech. I'm quoting, as we have proved our loyalty to you in the past in nursing your children, watching by the sickbed of your mothers and fathers, and often following them with tear-dimmed eyes to their graves, so in the future, in our humble way, we shall stand by you with the devotion that no foreigner can approach, ready to lay down our lives, if need be, in defense of yours, interlacing our industrial, commercial, civil, and religious life with yours in a way that shall make the interests of both races one. In all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. In order to understand the problem that Du Bois takes with, with this view, this line of reasoning, we need to understand two things. The first is that this claim effectively makes Washington very popular among white Southern businessmen and politicians. Why was this the case? Because the practice of conciliation, Du Bois wanted to say, was easier than the practice of reconstruction because it required nothing, if anything at all, on the part of whites. With conciliation, they did not have to reconstruct anything, distribute anything, let alone see their black counterparts as possessing equal standing. Recall what Du Bois says about this in that chapter. Many Southern whites, particularly white power holders, were too willing to effectively side with Washington because it was good for business. Andrew Carnegie, for example, extends a gift, $600,000 to, to the Tuskegee Institute. What Du Bois resented more than anything was the power that enveloped Washington. It was, of course, a contest over leadership. And certainly Du Bois thinks that he should lead black people, but it was about power. So the way that Du Bois is critical of the moneyed interest around Washington, I think is an early, if perhaps underdeveloped claim that Du Bois is gonna make much later about the ways in which a kind of capitalist competition emerges to thwart the practice of democracy and democratic leadership. What was lost in Washington's program, Du Bois wanted to say, was that it was born from a kind of despair. It was a kind of resignation, as Du Bois put it. It was a sense of doubt and hesitation that led him to surrender the struggle for attaining social equality. And of course, as we're talking about resignation here, recall the black boys, recall the figure of the black mother, what happens to their horizon? What happens to their sense of self when the message is communicated to them that all they should strive for, all they should pursue is a life of toiling. I'm quoting Du Bois here. His doctrine has tended to make the whites, North and South, shift the burden of Negro, of the Negro problem to the Negro shoulders and stand aside as critical and rather pessimistic spectators, when in fact the burden belongs to the nation and the hands of none of us are clean if we bend not our energies to righting these great wrongs. There was another problem with Washington's position. And in order to understand it, we need to go back to that opening chapter. What follows from the longing to know? What does the longing for knowledge and not simply a life of toiling suggest about one's own standing? I'm quoting Du Bois. In those somber forests of his striving, 
his own soul rose before him. And this is the first move. And he saw himself darkly as through a veil. And yet he saw in himself some faint revelation of his power, of his mission. He began to have a damn feeling. And I'm quoting him again, that to attain his place in the world, he must be himself and not another. He must be himself and not another. I think this is one of the most important lines in the book. Remember that earlier passage I referenced with respect to the other black boys. And remember that what Du Bois says about how one of the problems with the color line is that it reduces them to essentially, it, it reduces, it can reduce black people to essentially groveling for attention from their white counterparts. Sycophancy is the word that Du Bois uses there. We can now surmise that to be a sycophant, to grovel for the attention of another, usually someone with power or, or influence, is to be unfree because our capacities for right judgment are arrested by the need to please those who exercise control over us. To be oneself, one must be able to recognize their own actions, their own lives, as their own actions, as their own lives. To be free is to be authentically oneself. And this can hardly happen without the capacity as Du Bois wants to say, cultivated through humanistic education to work on ourselves through critical reflection. Here's that question he asks in Of the Training of Men. Is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And men ask this today all the more eagerly because of sinister signs in recent educational movements. He's talking about Booker T. Washington. The tendency is here, born of slavery, and quicken to renew life by the crazy imperialism of the day to regard human beings as among the material resources of a land to be trained with an eye single to future dividends. But life is more than the pursuit of wealth, Du Bois wants to say. And black people are more than items on a balance sheet. And black people are more than trainees to the benefit of capital. Du Bois also wants to say, per this earlier point, about Washington's popularity, that there is something about this popularity that places him outside the right practice of politics. This is Du Bois, but the hushing of the criticism of honest, of honest opponents is a dangerous thing. It leads some of the best of the critics to unfortunate silence and paralysis of effort and, and others to burst and to speak so passionately and intemperately as to lose listeners. And here is the, here's the line, honest and earnest criticism from those whose interests are most nearly touched. Criticism of writers by readers. This is the soul of democracy and the safeguard of modern society. If the best of the American Negroes received by outer pressure, a leader whom they had not recognized before, manifestly, there is here a certain palpable gain, yet there is also an irreparable loss a loss of that, peculiar, of that peculiarly valuable education which a group receives when by search and criticism, it finds and commissions its own leaders. Du Bois is critical of Washington, not only because he finds his political vision corrosive, but also because he thinks the very source of his popularity among black folks is achieved by out of pressure, that is by the out of pressure exerted by whites. I think Du Bois goes a step too far here. After all, Washington is himself a former slave, and so, and so he has a kind of authority that comes by virtue of being able to speak from this particular vantage point. So it's not clear if it is merely out of pressure that explains Washington's rise in popularity. And yet I understand Du Bois's point Washington is one of the few leaders of this period who can claim this kind of popularity among whites. And so what he wants to say, what Du Bois wants to say, and I think this is a timeless point, is that the foundation of any democratic society must be sub the, the, subjection, the subjecting of leaders to the criticism of those whom they lead. Du Bois is of course not without issue here, 
Soul sometimes spoke rather paternalistically about Black people as backwards and in need of being acculturated into the modern norms of civilization. There is nothing defensible here except to say that Du Bois begins to realize very quickly after the publishing of Souls that the expression of a genuine democratic society requires that he abandon this view. And he does abandon this view, most notably in Dark Water in 1920. It should be obvious that given how Du Bois proceeds to lay out a, pol a political philosophical vision, and given how he positions his vision against the broader white world, as well as the leaders with whom he disagrees, particularly Washington, that race is historically contingent, is fallible. There is tragedy to be sure. We see it rather forcefully in the story of Josie, for example. Josie is that tragic figure and of the meaning of progress. She is committed to trying to make a better life for herself, but repeatedly she comes up against the narrowing constraints exacted upon her by the color line. But what does the boy say about Josie? Then there, and I'm, and I'm quoting him here, then there was Josie herself. She seemed to be the center of the family, always busy at service or at home or berry picking a little nervous and inclined to scold like her mother, yet faithful too, like her father. She had about her a certain fineness, the shadow of an unconscious moral heroism that would willingly give all of life to make life broader, deeper, and fuller for her and hers. Josie longs and strives for a deeper sense of herself, even as she is constrained to this life. Here again, the specter posed by Washington appears once more, for Josie is not merely a toiler working her fingers to the bone, as Washington might want to be the case. Josie longs for something deeper. She wants to make life broader and fuller for her and hers. Nevertheless, it is in recognition of this contingency, the contingency of racial domination, that gives life to this argument defending the primacy of Black voices. It is in recognition of this argument that allows him to not become arrested by the tragedy of the veil. And he certainly counsels his readers to not become finally arrested either. On Du Bois's account, the existential doubt that arises from the color line is not final. Resistance is always on the table. Joy is always on the table. Faith is always on the table. As Du Bois says, inspiration exists alongside doubt. Nowhere was this more apparent than in the sorrow songs, those expressions of longing on the part of the lowly. It was through their voices, through the rendering of a deep emotional appeal that clarifies their standing as well as the meaning of their struggle. As Du Bois says, when struck with the sudden poverty, the United States refused to fulfill its promises of land to the freedmen. A brigadier general went down to the Sea Islands to carry the news. An old woman on the outskirts of the throng began singing this song. All the mass joined with her swaying and the soldier wept. That the soldier wept and the mass swayed in response to the news of a foreclosed possibility is itself a kind of ensemble of the senses. It highlights, to go back to the point we made toward the beginning of the talk, that the dramaturgy, the drama that is characteristic of any genuinely free community of persons. What the conditions of racial subjugation amount to are not only located in propositional claims, they are also located in the senses and are expressed through the outward feeling of sorrow, of disappointment, resignation, misery, rage, these feelings motivate action. And moreover, they function to habituate the community to the right kinds of sensibilities, which are the basis of a substantively, a substantively democratic society. There is a shared affect of space. The soldier registers a sense of shame for having failed his black counterparts. The black people singing experience a nearly unbearable disappointment, which leads them to moan because the pain of what has fallen upon them is so deep. 
And at the same time, these songs are the music, as the boy says, the music of an unhappy people, of the children of disappointment. They tell of death and suffering and unvoiced, unvoiced longing, unvoiced longing toward a truer world of misty wanderings and hidden ways. These songs then may also be understood as projections into the future. For even in the disappointment expressed by those who sing them, they cast a shadow into the future to signal that the color line is not a settled matter. There is a futurity in sorrow. There is a futurity in the sorrow song. At the end of that first chapter, Du Bois says that the striving toward a democratic society flows through unsettling the problem of racial subjection. It is the great test of the underlying principles of the Republic. And here we come back to where we began. By turning to black life, Du Bois imagines a world that can call the nation into a different relationship with itself. Because who knows more about what a free community requires than the subjection, than the subjective, dispossessed, enslaved, demeaned, and insulted. Thank you.